Hello, Ferrari Cash. Uh, hello, mate. Can I get a ride? Picking up from number seven corner, Singapore. No problem. The car is on the way. The driver's name is Fernando. Uh, um, can you tell me how much that'll be, mate? Certainly, that will be ten grid places. Hello and welcome to Gareth Jones on Speed. I'm Gareth, he's Zog. Hello. And he's Richard. Nice to have you back, Richard. Hello, nice to be back. You've been in Frenchland, haven't you? I uh, have. I've been in Frenchland, I've been in Germany, I've been all over Europe. Driving interesting things? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, looking at interesting no, things. No, anyway. looking at interesting things. I went to the Frankfurt Motor Show and looked at some stuff. And then I just went on holiday to do France for a week and I hired a Peugeot 208, which was actually okay. Shock. Damned with faint praise. That, <laughs> that's a shocking piece of news. Peugeot 208. Okay, we'll come to all that in due course on the programme. But I know that Richard wasn't able to see the Singapore Grand Prix, you see, Zog. Mm, so ah. we're going to have to tell him the key stuff that happened at the Singapore Grand Prix. The most shocking thing is that Alonso and Weber got in trouble for being a taxi service. That's just wrong, isn't it? Well, yes and no. I sort of hate that I'm saying this, but it's actually quite right, I think, that Weber got the penalty. And I'm saying that because it was the third reprimand that he's got. You get a reprimand for a little offence here or there, and when you get three of them then you get the grid penalty. Yeah. Or a another proper punishment. Now, yes, it's absurd that anybody should be penalised for a bit of sportsman-like behaviour and for something that's just given a bit more entertainment. Yeah. A little heartwarming act of sportsmanship. Exactly. Bad, I mean, but the thing is, he was told by a marshal that he wasn't to go onto the track. Now, we rely on the drivers to give us a good show and to give us a good race. We rely on the marshals to keep it safe. And if a driver, even Mark Webber, is ignoring the marshals, then he's ignoring the guys who are responsible for safety, and it's quite right that he should get a reprimand for that. It's his third one, which it is in this case. It's unfortunate that he gets the grid penalty for that. Yeah, it's a you, terrible result, but the marshal was quite right to give him the reprimand. You can, you can see why Mark Webber, sort of aware of this potential for trouble, still went ahead with it. He's thinking, I'm out of here, mate. I've done my bidding Formula One. I'm, what are they going to do? And that would have well, driven him to be a bit more loose and fruity than he normally would. But his first two reprimands, as I understand, the first one was for being a bit tall for a Formula One driver, and the second one was for not being Vettel. So it does pile up, and it's not fair. Mark Webber is not the kind of driver you would expect to pick up reprimands for bad behaviour. He's by the book, isn't he? He's a good guy. Well, hang on, because one of these previous offences was ignoring yellow flags, which is actually pretty much sort of racing driver 101, isn't it? I mean, (laughs) really, if you don't know what the yellow flags mean and what you should do, then you're being, in terms that Mark Webber would understand, a bit of a grad galah, and he should pull himself together. Indeed, but then even good drivers make mistakes from time to time, and when they make the wrong kind of mistake, reprimand. I'm a bit torn about this whole Alonso Webber thing, because... It's causing us a lot of heartache. Because I agree that he was being a bit of a div when you watch that CCTV footage they've released of him getting onto Alonso's car and almost being clipped by a couple of other cars uh, it does Lu- make you wince yeah. and you Lewis think, was one of them was yeah Perez I think he was one, yeah. Uh, oh, and yeah. you think, that could have been really bad yeah. and he probably well, should it could be know really bad. Yeah, better yeah. but I just liked it because it was not any sportsman like but I thought it humanised yeah. sometimes inhuman sport yes, and so. um, that is really good also third plus for me reminded me of Nigel Mansell and exactly. at the British Grand Prix uh, yep. what 22 years ago which yep. is still a great moment again because and it was Schumacher a human moment Lacey. yeah oh yeah that's, that's the one for me I've forgotten about yeah. that yeah. Yeah. so you know yeah. no no yeah, exactly brought back very happy memories but maybe it would be nice if the marshal hadn't seen Weber and hadn't had a chance to tell him not to walk on the track or whatever it, it happened I uh, tell you what, for collectors of 143rd scale F1 cars and Le Mans cars, like me and thee, there's got to be a special edition of that Ferrari with Weber sitting on the side pod. <laughs> oh, there will be. Yeah, but there'll be some be. very complicated contractual wrangling to go on to make <laughs> that sort of thing happen. Because even getting the right driver from the right team in a car, in his right helmet, requires reams and reams of contract work. To have a Red Bull driver sitting on a Ferrari, how are they going to divvy up the money from that one then, Ferrari and Alonso's management? Yeah, they'll figure it out. What's interesting, actually, is that McLaren discovered with dismay that their car would actually handle better if Mark Webber was sitting on (laughs) one of the side pods in future races, and I believe some negotiations are ongoing. (laughs) And I think Perez's car would probably handle a lot better if Mark Webber drove it. (laughs) Oh, it probably would.
Well, probably right. I mean, the other thing about that race, about what, well, the awful predictability of Vettel winning the race once he'd qualified it on pole. The other great thing was Raikkonen. I mean, mm. he was pulling off some fantastic moves. I mean, that, the power actually, of painkillers on. Hamilton in particular was absolutely smashing. Yeah. He uh, was right on it, wasn't he? Yeah. When you say right on it, do you mean Cocodamol? Is that what? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> at least that. Other painkillers are available. Rohypnol, you know. No, but, but <laughs> kip, no that's not a painkiller. I think yeah. it is actually a painkiller, isn't it? For horses. No, that's probably. ketamine. Yeah, that's ketamine. Ketamine. Ketamine's a horse. Well, right. quality, but yeah. Rohypnol is the so called date rape drug, but I think it is really meant to be a painkiller. Uh, or a well, sleeping drug. If you gave that to Kimi Räikkönen, it would be impossible to tell any difference between <laughs> really, just... wouldn't it? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is he allowed to take oral painkillers on the basis that a lot of them say do not take with alcohol? Uh, and, uh, this is Kimi. Yeah, it's a Kimi. foregone conclusion, yeah, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> There's uh, got to be some in the system somewhere. We did the most extraordinary thing about the Singapore Grand Prix was not the fact that Weber got into trouble for hitching a ride from Turn 7 or wherever it was with Alonso. It was the fact that Alonso actually did something for the greater good. I know he was beckoned down by Weber, but for Alonso then to say, no, of course, have a ride, I'm going to be generous with myself here, that's very out of character. He and Weber are buddies, aren't they? You know, they are, yeah. Been, uh, yeah. yeah they've well, they're, they're bonded somewhere. by their mutual dislike of Sebastian Vettel. Is so that what it is? <laughs> I'm only speculating. But there was that brilliantly awkward photo of the two of them having dinner together that was really Yes, I saw that in the little pizzeria really somewhere. Weird. It was, it just, yeah. They, they just looked like a sort of strange married couple on holiday. Oh, take a photo. Go on, take a photo of us here, yeah. How about Fernando Alonso in Italy, his selfie, his selfie yeah. in front of the crowd. I have thought that was a this? wonderful moment. I have you seen this? Day. When he was up on the platform, one of the photographers for someone like Sutton Images, other photographers are available, offered up his iPhone to Alonso mm. and said, go on, do a selfie. And he did this fantastic, big, smiley Oh, sorry, I have foreground. seen that. Yes, it's quite yeah. sweet, with all, isn't it? It's with nice, all the booing fantastic. tifosi yeah. behind. Now, I was going to say this for another part of the programme. Can we talk about it now? I hate the booing. As much as I dislike Alonso, I cannot condone anybody booing any driver. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even I boo Alonso. And why are they booing Vettel? I don't think he deserves it. He's quite a nice no, bloke. He's, he's just, just quick. He's just doing oh, his agree. job agree. properly. Yeah. Just, it's rotten, isn't it? I don't think there's any driver deserves to be booed at all under any circumstances. Unless they've done something really stupid. But winning a race... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. By all means, shout for your guy, but don't bring the negativity. By I've got a Vettel. solution that's... for it. I've got a solution. Next time somebody boos a driver on the podium, I'm going to go and stand underneath the podium myself and Boo those who are booing the driver on the podium. That'll stop them. Oh, it's a good old fashioned uh, boo off. I like this. <laughs> it just reminds me of there's a gag in The Simpsons where Mr. Burns gets booed and then he says to Smithers, Are they saying boo or boo earns? Uh, they're saying boo earns, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to work out, I was trying to think of a gag to yeah. do on Twitter, but then Vettel's name doesn't sound anything like boo. Throwing rotten so. tomatoes is a traditional sign yeah. of respect. <laughs> Great win, Seb. Well done. Hey, uh, are you okay? Not really, Christian. The crowds, they do not like me. What are you talking about? They love you. Then why are they booing? Booing? What? Yeah, no, you, you're mistaken, Seb. Here, listen carefully. <laughs> ah, I did not realize the whole Raikkonen family was here this weekend. You know that expression, there's trouble at mill. I don't know if they say it in Maranello as well, there's trouble at Maranello. Not with that accent, anyway. Is that a North Italian accent? Maranello. <laughs> I'm from, <laughs> from Milan, I said. That's that old Christopher Eccleston era Doctor Who gag about other places have a North. Yeah. Do they talk like that in Northern Italy then as well? I'm yeah. always interested in other accents because you tune into the accents of your homeland, but there are accents in every country. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, the, the, we're sort the, of the Bavarian accent them. is very yes. different to the regular German accent. But yeah. you're right, can't you can't tell. No, because I was Probably. thinking this when I was on holiday because in the south of France, but I was thinking, God, it'd be quite nice to live here. The south of France. Of course, they France. speak like that in yes. the well, south of France. Yes. I imagine they do. I think a lot of them speak the Russian accent now, certainly on the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but if you live there and you started speaking French more fluently, 
would you end up with, inadvertently, a southern accent? And then you'd go to Paris and people would mock you in some way. As happened to a chap I used to know who lived in Italy. But he lived down in Naples. And then, just before he left Italy, he'd lived there for about a year, he went up to Milan to go and see some friends. And he was out with a group of their mates. And they were openly mocking him for essentially having a yokel accent. He didn't know that he'd basically been living for a year. And And he came up and went, all right, there, my lover! (laughs) (laughs) He had a sophisticated Italian accent. Yeah, exactly. Very, very, very I, I had a mate from uh, where's the French Ford plant? Saint Louis. Saint Louis. Yeah, he was from Saint Louis. He learnt his English in North Wales. <laughs> he was very French, apart from when he spoke English. In which case, he sounded like he was from Rill. It was amazing. <laughs> anyway, we've got off topic. There's trouble at Mill. There's trouble at Marinello. Because if you're booking Kimi Raikkonen as your Hmm. Equal number one driver because he's not going to be the number two, is he? No. Is he? Is he? No, no, no is way. He? No is way. He? Then you are simply asking for trouble if Alonso is your number one driver. That joke that we've had going for years: Alonso is faster than you. Kimmy's not going to respond well to that, is he? Didn't Martin Brundle rather amusingly tweet that the reply, if Kimmy was told Fernando is faster than you, would be? Well, why is he behind me then? (laughs) (laughs) Very good. That's exactly Uh, how it's going to be. And I think that sums it up very nicely. Kimmy at Ferrari, you couldn't have predicted that, could you? Well, actually, maybe we did, because we said he wasn't going to stay at Lotus because they weren't paying him, and it turned out to be absolutely true. Yes, yes Some of my sources are reliable, apparently. The big question is, how is Fernando going to deal with Kimmy? I've already had a couple of arguments slash discussions with friends about when the clashes will start or whether they'll be... You it's know, going to be playing sailing, Richard, haven't. surely, isn't it? Alonso not going to create any waves with No, the, yeah, he no. loves having another driver in the team who mm. can give him a run for his money. <laughs> oh, no, wait, he hates that. That's right. I knew it was he one or the other. That's a bitch. And I, I would struggle to think of another driver in the current Formula One pack who is less of a bitch. Kimmy's not even his own bitch, is he? he just does what he wants. He's brilliant in that respect. So this is going to be interesting. Unless... It it is going to be I'm genuinely uncertain about this because Fernando likes to be clear number one. But he has matured a bit since he was as childish as he was with Lewis and McLaren. Mm. And I think given that he'd said that of the options he'd rather have Kimmy in the team alongside him. I think that probably indicates that he's maybe a bit more open. I don't know. I'm just going to wait and see. I think there's a very good chance they're going to come together at some point. Yeah. But I don't think Alonso is going to be throwing his toys out of the pram, at least at the start of the season. Let's give it a couple of races, yeah. The rumour now is, of course, because Weber is not driving for Red Bull next season, he's actually going to just sit on the side pod of Alonso's car all races and help out with the driving. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, two heads are better than one. Uh, Throw things. Lightly buttered toast at Raikkonen. Ooh, that would be annoying. Just a a smear of butter on your (laughs) crash helmet visor. Or just some hot Ribena. Oh, burns, and it's sticky as well. Oh. Uh, can I bring us back to the reality of this gentleman for a moment? The concern I have is that the damage is already done. It won't take anything that Kimmy says or demands. The fact that Ferrari have put their faith in another top dog driver will immediately undermine Alonso's position, which was recently undermined by De Montezemolo, who had to have a word with Alonso, didn't he? He yeah. told him off. And maybe it's this environment which has allowed these rumours of Alonso returning to McLaren to fester. I mean, there's some reality in this. As far as I understand, it was started when the friendly skeleton, as you call him, Richard... Martin Whitmarsh. Martin Whitmarsh was asked, would you have Alonso back? And you're right, he's a great driver. He didn't deny it. Hmm. But I think there's something else going on because you hear these things murmuring around the paddock connected. And people aren't ruling it out. What Martin Whitmarsh said, well, well, I think we'll probably have the same drivers next year, but we're not in a hurry. That usually means I have no idea how it's going to play out at this time. It depends. But would you have Alonso back at McLaren? Yes, I think is the answer. Because he'll bring information from Ferrari. He's one of the best two drivers out there, along with Lewis. Well, if you want information from Ferrari, just go to a photocopier shop and um, it'll come along. But... I don't know how long Alonso's contract is. I don't know if that's actually public information, is it? I'm not sure. I should have looked this up. I have an idea it's 2015, but I'm not sure. Okay, so that would be a barrier to that happening. But also, just for sake of argument, it does happen. Alonso has a fit of pique at a Raikkonen arriving and decides to scarper, goes to McLaren, 
and promises not to stab them in the back this time, and they say, OK, but who do they get rid of? Yeah, <sighs> yeah good question. Because um, I don't know what the contractual situation is with Button or with Perez. Uh, I but, think Perez... Button's just signed, I believe. Button's just confirmed another year or two years. They just took up an option, I believe. Yeah, right, I believe okay. so, yeah. But Perez, they want his money yes. at the moment. But Alonso would be a great Spanish-speaking spokesman for all the sponsorship that comes with Perez. So you can see how that would work there. It's beyond our ken. There are so many machinations, there's so many variables in play here that it just is what it is. We can't predict it. We keep saying things like, yes, that makes sense, he could go there, but then something really bonkers happens in Formula One. And it's easily driven by money. I mean, one thing that does cross my mind is that the strength of the Alonso to McLaren rumours, if anything, it makes me optimistic about McLaren's speed next year, to be honest, because I don't <laughs> think if there's any sort of talk about Alonso going to McLaren, I assume he's pretty confident that they're going to be getting quicker. Yes, but... If you were looking at this, you'd say, hang on a minute, they're going to have one more year of Mercedes say, power, but with a new engine. So I know that Merck engine, you know, there's all sorts of things about, oh, that's going to be terrific because they've been working on it for a long time. Mm. Mm, it's still running in quantity. And then yeah. they only have one yeah, year yeah. of that. And then they've got Honda turning up. And yeah. I mean, Honda's mm. last yeah. foray into Formula One was bloody awful. So well, if you were yeah, being but, shrewd about but. it, you'd say, I'm not sure that McLaren is a safer bet than Ferrari, even with Kimi Raikkonen like an insolent teenager, loafing about and then out-qualifying me. I'm not saying that this is a safer bet, but I'm just saying that they're not going to be as rubbish as they have been this year, you know? Well, <laughs> let's hope not, <laughs> otherwise they'll be outperformed by Marussia. One other amazing rumour that seems to be going around at the moment is that Ross Braun will go to Williams next season. Have you yeah. heard about this? Well, I yeah. like the sound yeah. of this. That's promising. Well, you were telling me, yeah. Gareth, the rumour is he'll buy into the yeah. team. Yeah, well, he's lost some of his ownership of what was the Braun team to Mercedes, and he's been replaced in management terms by the Total, Wolfinator yeah. mm. and mm. Nicky Lauder. I'll say that a bit quieter. Nicky Lauder. That's a joke in reverse, that you see. So, you know, he likes to have a better control. And I think Ross Braun is the only man who could save Williams. Because when mm. you start falling mm. off the back yeah. of the grid, you need an almighty shove to get it forward. He did it at Honda slash Braun slash Mercedes. He did it at Ferrari. I'd love to see him do it at Williams. I don't know whether he's the only person, but I think he's certainly the best person to kind of come in and give him a hand. You've still got Claire Williams as the CEO or whatever. Yeah. But then day-to-day -day running of the team, the kind of Patrick Head character, becomes Ross Braun. This would be brilliant. All oh, right, so, Patrick, let me get this uh, clear. Uh, some minor self-inflicted mishap, uh, become senselessly angry with myself and the entire world, and then say the catchphrase, Grr, flipping heck. No, no, no! That's not it at all! Uh, Ruddy Nora? You're doing it all wrong! Come on, man! Concentrate! Uh, sodding blimey, is that it? Uh, bloody hell! Gareth Jones on speed. I don't know if you're running the latest add-on for iOS 6 on your phone that you're listening to this podcast. Uh, Ray, what do you we? mean by an add-on for iOS 6? Well, uh, I believe that there is an app that you can download uh, now which allows you to create olfactory stimulation around a podcast. So if you just sniff your phone right now, just sniff... Yeah. Can you smell German sausage? You should be able to if you've got that app. Uh, Richard, I detected it's actually emanating from you. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, this is a riff that I do with my <laughs> we dog. Got there, we got there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I might have mentioned this on the show before, but I have this terrible thing where I talk to my dog, but then I do my dog's voice talking back to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. my latest thing that I do to amuse myself, and presumably not her because she's a dog, is I'll come back from somewhere and she'll go... You smell of Peugeot's. What have you been doing? <laughs> She's become like a suspicious wife or something. You smell of Germany. Why is that? <laughs> you smell of the Lufthansa check-in desk. <laughs> and, uh, of, course, of course, this whole, you know, dog speaking on behalf of your dog thing does actually it's, ensure that you get to have a conversation with your dog rather than exactly. yeah. talking to yourself. And honestly, my dog's hilarious do. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and does she like the smell of Germany? She was a bit suspicious of it. Have you been looking at cars? I sound like a 
loony. But anyway, Richard, I have Richard, been to Germany. I've known you ten years. That's you are true. a loony. Well, let's move on from the whole dog talking <laughs> thing. Um, you went to Frankfurt. I went to Frankfurt to the motor show, yeah. and you may have read or heard things about the vastness of the Frankfurt show. It is enormous, and it's in different time zones. Well, isn't it, it? it practically is, and the mm. Mercedes stand alone, which occupies one whole hall and takes them weeks to build is bigger than the original Frankfurt Motor Show way back in the 50s or 60s. So each German manufacturer has a sort of whole motor show of their own. Mm. So they need more Lebensraum? It's a bit like that. Mm. Then everyone else gets sort of shunted into these other halls. Normal size stands, but if you're VW, Audi, Mercedes or BMW particularly, you get an Uber stand. An interesting show, but actually interesting in as much as it wasn't that interesting. (laughs) (laughs) I was wandering around and I was looking at people like Peugeot and Opel and Citroen and Renault and I was just thinking, you're putting on a show here to paper over the cracks. There's a sense of desperation. They're all losing money. They all Mm. have too many factories in Europe Mm. making cars that people don't particularly want without substantial discounts. Mm -hmm. And And they're mostly making things with... They use powertrains that may have a limited future. Or, but yeah, that's, that's the, the thing, and they're locked into, because these vast factories, they can't close down because of various things. Not least, uh, Certainly in France and Germany, they have terrible trouble still negotiating redundancies because the union is very powerful there, and they have to keep these plants churning over. Peugeot have had a bit of a breakthrough, actually, because they have managed to just negotiate. They're going to shut down one of their factories, and that will help them with overcapacity they have. Mm. But all the factories they have are of an age, they want to keep using the equipment as long as they can, so they're locked into making tin boxes with internal combustion engines, Mm -hmm. or slight variations thereof and there's just a sense of slight desperation and then you go Mm. to a motor show and there's all the razzmatazz and the stands which are quite substantial and lavishly carpeted and there are the lights and the music and the show cars and all the rest of it and you just think oh God, it's like someone who's going through a messy divorce but still going out and throwing a slightly sad yeah, and desperate to... party in order to exactly the house yeah. is very yeah. tidy but there's yeah. no love between exactly. the partners exactly that's the thing it's just it's all a bit depressing I may be reading too much into it but that is essentially one of the big impressions that I got conversely there are some people who seem to be on a bit of an upswing Mm-hmm. And there weren't many standout cars from the show. There were some good attempts. There were some ruddy, awful things. Have you seen that Lexus concept? That sort of small four by four SUV Bonkers, isn't it? crossover thing. Bonkers. It's dreadful. I'm not a car designer, but it seemed to me that it made one very, very fundamental mistake, which is it looked like the roof could be crushed with a bare hand. It mm. looked weak. Mm. And that's not no, Lexus. I think their, that's design very, is, um... their design is actually sort of not bad. I think that that current GS is a very nice looking car. Yes, sir. And I've just been driving the new ish IS, and again, it's not a bad looking thing. Handsome. The, the interior we, we, is the really good on that. was lovely. We yeah. loved that. But this mm. thing, is, it looks overcooked. Yeah, the lines everywhere. Creases and lines and yeah. shapes, but then parts of it look like it's been in a crash. And the roof, pillars look flimsy and thin. And of all things, people buy these crossovers, SUVs, call them what you will, these sort of soft rotors, because they get that false impression of extra strength and safety that you don't get in a normal car. And mm. so if this thing, which is only a concept, thank God, but if it makes its production, they've got to sort it out because it's awful. You have 20 words on the Jaguar, what's he called? The CX-17? Oh, well, I was going to see so it was bringing me to that because converse to the trend of, oh, there's a bare bit of metal, let's put a crease or a slash on it, mm. the Jaguar CX-17, which mm. is their soft rotor concept, is incredibly clean and simple. The sides of it are very sleek and there's no sort of superfluous decoration on it. It's something that Jaguars seem to do very well if you look at the XF and the XJ. It, they're all quite mm, sleek. They have lines where they need them to create sort of bonnet humps and things like that, but they're not just covered in random in creases. It's based on the Evoque, presumably. It's not. It's based on Jaguar's brand new or MDP, aluminium... What's it called? Multi- oh, IDP. I can't remember. It's got a name, but it's... Do you know what it looks platform. like to me, though? It looks like a Volvo XC60 that's had a Jag grill put on and then someone's connected a high pressure air hose to the exhaust and ever so slightly overinflated it so it's just made it that so much tauter it's a very good looking car As it looks, very, go, yeah, looks it very familiar I think yes it's not the most original thing and I think mm. they're locked into it having to be that sort of shape because that's what people want yeah. but mm, uh, yeah. within that the what car designers call the surfacing the actual metal work is very clean and again what the designers would call the stance the way that it sits on mm-hmm. its wheels is very good the wheels are right out to the sides of the body they were, I think were 23 inch on the concept so that <laughs> 
they won't be that production. production. Yeah. However, that's about the only thing that yeah. won't. I have never seen a more production ready concept. Even the door mm. handles, which usually in concepts, you know, become like sort of flush touch screen things. You yeah. swipe it like an iPhone and mm. it's always just going to get thrown away. The door mirrors are usually little cameras. And again, that's never going to happen. This thing's got proper door mirrors, proper door handles. You could see it parked outside now. And that's my only concern about it. There's no secret they are going to do that car. Yeah, we know that, don't we? And I just think, well, it's going to be, what, two, three years away that actually it might not look super modern when it finally arrives because it looks bang on the money right now. Mm. That's um, the trouble, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, sorry, to answer your questions, Og, it's their new all-aluminium platform that will be Jaguar's sort of bedrock and is scalable. So it will be first seen, I think, in their new small saloon that will be the same as a 3 Series or a C-Class or an IS or something. And then there'll be the soft rotor and then the next XF will be on that chassis and it'll be sort of squeezed and expanded all which way. And it has one of the most complicated and expensive parts of a modern car is all the electrical system, a little preview of all that and the chucking a load of you've, money at you've it. You've got to say mm. about Jaguar and Land Rover at the moment, if we're quiet, if we listen, listen, you can actually hear the sound of arses being kicked in Dearborn, can't you? Yes. You can hear Ford <laughs> going, no, we should not, oh, we should have invested, not let it go, because that's what saved it. The it's nation. just nice to see Jaguar and Land Rover behaving like a proper car company mm. now, oh, seeming yeah, to do fantastic. things properly, tending to make a broader range of cars and doing it well. And if they can some, make them... Doing some good ones. Yeah, right? and to give them now, all their cars at the moment drive really nicely. If they can make them reliable, I'm not convinced they always do necessarily, <laughs> from apocryphal stories that I hear, but if they can sort that... Mm. and the design is great mm. on both sides I mean some people find the Range Rover a bit chintzy I think it's quite a handsome thing Richard you said to me earlier on because we're getting close to the end of this programme now you said to me that there was only one really interesting car at Frankfurt yes. really? yeah and it's not, not the, the Jag Aud- and not, not the, the Audi Parkour which was actually just the uh, not the Audi what's it called the Audi Nanook which oh, was yeah. actually the Etel yeah. Parkour God, that's a weird again. thing I know which mm. apparently someone stuffed it at Goodwood and that may be why they were able to put an Audi grill on it because it needed to be <laughs> rebuilt <anyway. laughs> really one and a half interesting cars one and, and were- a half okay what's the half an interesting car do you want to say well they're that? both BMWs right. the half an interesting car was the BMW i8 it's their new yeah. hybrid supercar it has a three cylinder petrol engine and electric motors it's going to be about £100,000, I think, so it'll be sort of 911 rival. It will offer that kind of performance, mm. but it can mm. run purely electric. And strangely, when it's purely electric, it's front-wheel drive as well. So you'll be tootling wow. through town in a front-wheel drive BMW supercar, strange. And then when you want to give it some, it'll be four-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive, depending on which yep. bits of the drivetrain are working. Quick question, I know you're in a hurry, but does that mean that the rear wheels are actually driven directly by the petrol engine mm. and it's not a range I extender? I believe not, no. Uh, I've uh, seen the pictures and it looks fantastic. And, yeah, uh, and, uh, it looks the amazing. Figures, I thought, yes, please, I'll have some of that. It does, um, however, it looks fantastic. it's £100,000. I hope you'll see them around because it's a hell of a nice-looking thing. But it's a bit otherworldly. Mm-hmm. More mm. real-worldly, and the most interesting car for me at Frankfurt was the BMW. W i3, which is the small yeah, car. Little, small yeah. car. Yeah. It's a Golf mad size. looking thing. Yeah, possibly even a bit smaller. Uh-huh. It's hard to tell. I think it looks big. Golf minus. Kind of mini They size. don't do that. They mini do the mini size. Size. They do the Golf Plus. Why don't they do the Golf Minus? I think it's called slight... a Polo, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you haven't seen it, go and look it up. It looks like a concept car, and yet it is real. You'll be able to buy one as of, well, you can order one now. It has the most interesting interior I've seen for a while. It's really sort of futuristic, and in some trims it has this kind of wood, like a 70s TV but nicer than that might sound all this sort of innovative new materials being used it's a carbon fibre shell sitting on aluminium chassis in which the batteries live yeah. you can have a range extender one which uses a two cylinder motorcycle engine just as an onboard mm. generator which not what I go for. wheel perfectly sensible solution and it just makes all other cars look a bit old fashioned I'm speaking because mm. I looked at this and I thought hang on a minute I live in London my little Fiat 500 twin air I don't think I've left London in it for about six months mm. I could see myself in one of these i3s Interesting. zipping around using cheap electricity because right now there are so many free or nearly free charge up points I think it, now is the time to get an electric car yeah. when they're well, starting to work properly and those range extender thing means that they're not just bound by the electric range this is the perfect time you could run that thing on buttons well and also let's not forget that even if the electricity isn't free and you're charging it up from regular main supply and paying what you usually pay for main electricity, it's still very cheap. Yeah. Watch this space. I will come back yeah. to this because if it wasn't for the fact that we're having a baby and that I need to be sensible, I am well, a hell, tear away from Now you tell us. <laughs> well, I'm not, saying that, not me personally, I was just, this is just beer gut. Oh. But I am a gnat tear away from just going into a BMW garage and going, oh, go on, I'll have one of those because I think it's just the most interesting, fantastic car. And I had a ride him on the Frankfurt show. This is one final thing the Frankfurt show. I was saying it's large. It's so large, they lay on ferry cars 
on press day to get idle journalists from one side of this vast site to the they other. They used real minis, didn't they? They used real minis. They I'm, had a Mercedes S classes. Yeah. But I waited in a queue for 20 <laughs> minutes and ignored. There was a Skoda Octavia's and all sorts going by mm. to get a ride in an i3, and it was worth it. And the guy that drove was clearly keen to show the performance. He gunned it, and it felt really quick as well, but silent, and that immediate surge you get from electric power. And I just thought, like this it. is now realistically looking like some kind of future, and an interesting one. You don't have to tell me about that, but I will come back to electric cars and why I think hydrogen is the better option than batteries mm. soon, another well, time. But not right now, because we're running out of airtime. But I'm convinced that I will be driving an electric car sometime in the next six months on a pretty permanent basis I think that's what's going to happen anyway you've been listening to the faint whiff of Germany from Richard Porter <laughs> goodbye uh, the voice of reason that is Zog goodbye you're always the voice of reason <laughs> and I'll leave you with this thought can we match that accent thing about northern things right what is it with the German motor industry that they're obsessed with the north at the moment for instance you've got the VW E up the most northern car ever made and now the BMW i8 that was Gareth See you. You smell of podcast. <laughs> to send us an email, see pictures, get song lyrics, join our Facebook fan site, follow us on Twitter, or to find out about sponsorship opportunities, go to garethjones.tv. Gareth Jones on Speed is made in London by Whizbang. Gareth Jones!